really excited about it. Today we start a brand new series called The God of Control. The God of Control. Anybody in here today, you can admit you like being in control. Where are all the honest people at? Okay, there you are. That's right. Okay, don't point at your spouse, by the way. That wouldn't really help anything. Point it at people you love. But, but even if you did, even if you did point at somebody you love, you're, you're probably not lying because the truth is we love to be in control. We like to be in control of just about everything, right? The, the way my life goes, the way my career unfolds, the way my spouse drives, hello, like just, just about everything in our life, we really like to be in control of it. And that's one of the frustrations of life is that we would have to admit today that we have much less control than we'd care to admit. I think sometimes on the outside, we like to project to people that our life is figured out and we have a handle on everything. But deep down, we kind of know, man, that my, my life's a little bit out of control. I can't control everything. In fact, today, to help us understand this, we have a, a, an illustration we're going to throw up uh, on the screen. This illustration is the circle of control that you have. This is the only thing in your life, the Bible says, that you even have a potential to have control over, and that's yourself. Right? The Bible talks about this thing called self-control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. I know some of us are still learning this, but you can actually control yourself. But that's about it. In, in fact, everything else in life, we throw up the next picture. This is everything else in life that we cannot control. And I bet one of these might jump out to you specifically. you got sickness, right, your spouse, the past, gas prices. Has anybody noticed? It's gone up like a dollar in the last two weeks. I don't know if the Lord's coming back or what, but it's, it's been outrageous. We can't control that, the economy, politics. There's all these things that we can't control, and yet I wonder how much of our life we spend trying to, fearing, fretting, and worrying about things we can't control. Some of us, we spend the most of our energy, the best of our time, sleepless nights, trying to control things simply that we cannot control. Well, the Bible talks about, you know, there's only one thing you can control, and, and here's a hint. It's not other people, right? It's not your spouse. It's definitely not your kids. It's not even your health at times, right? It's, it's not what's right and wrong. You don't get to decide what's just and what other people get or what they deserve. The only thing we control is ourselves. what comes out of our mouth, the actions that we do, right, the character that we have. But even Jesus tells us what to do with our little circle of control. And really, it's the heartbeat of this series. Matthew 16 and verse 24, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Meaning you can't even really be in control of your life until you surrender it to God. He's saying, I, 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 will you surrender the circle of control? Right? The, the only thing that you can control, will you actually surrender that to me? Because if you do, not only will you find me, God says, not only will you find God, but you'll find yourself. You'll find who you really are, and you'll find life. This is Jesus saying, hey, I, I control everything, but there's one thing I don't want to control. There's one thing I've chosen not to control, and that's you. I, I don't want to make you love me. I don't want to make you follow me. I'm going to give you the choice to surrender to me. And really, contrary to popular belief, um, surrendering your life is not a sign of weakness. It, it's actually not you giving up not having any dreams and just being apathetic to life. It's actually the opposite. It's you going for it, being full of passion, having as much hope as you could have because your hope is not tied to you. It's tied to God. It, it, our life is not just our project. It's God's project. He could do much more with our life if we would give it to him, much more than we could do. And so really surrendering our life. I know in this world it's a sign of weakness, but, but, but in God's kingdom it's the, it's the strongest move you can make. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, really, this series is just recognizing that there is a God, and it's not me. There is a God who's in control, and it's not me. And, and the quicker I can learn how to surrender that to him, the quicker I'll find peace in my life and let go of things. How do I surrender my life to God? I believe Jesus shows us exactly how to do that in the story that we're going to read about today. You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated our first Easter together. It's pretty awesome. Last week, we wrapped up our first Easter series, and really, Easter is the culmination of Jesus' time here on earth. It's, it's the ending of his ministry, the grand finale, uh, if you will. But today we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. The beginning, but before Jesus ever does a miracle, before he preaches a message or has one follower, we're going to go read about that. When Jesus really was a nobody, nobody really knew who he was yet. And I believe it's in this story that you actually see the victory of Jesus. Because in God's kingdom, true victory doesn't come when you see success but it comes when you surrender to God. It doesn't just come when you see the success of the fruit. It comes when you surrender to God. We see Jesus' victory on Easter, on the cross, but I think he, he, he won way before that. 
And the moment he decided to surrender to God's will, and the story we're going to read in Matthew chapter 4. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 4 today. Here's a little bit of context. At this time, Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River, which, by the way, is a real place. The Bible is not a fiction story. It, it, it is a story about real people in real time in real places. And it's backed by historians and scientists and all that. You could go visit the Jordan River today. It's, it's on the border of the country of Israel. Jesus is getting baptized by his cousin. His name's John the Baptist. And the Bible says when he comes out of the water, the Spirit of God, the power of God comes down upon him. It's pretty awesome. He's ready now. He, he's ready to do the work of ministry that his father has called him here to do. But what happens next is actually really surprising to me. Like, like this is Jesus sending out party. You know, like he just graduated college, if you will. He got his doctorate degree, his pastoral license, his cosmetology certificate, whatever it is for you. He got his rite of passage. He has the Holy Spirit. He's ready to go. What's the first place you think he would go? His first place to fulfill this work of ministry is father. Where would he go? I would think it'd probably be like a crowd or a crusade somewhere with a microphone, somewhere where he can like heal somebody. That's what I would think. But, but what actually happens is a little bit surprising. That's where we pick up the story. Matthew chapter 4 in verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. It says in Matthew chapter 4, he's baptized. He comes out of the water. And then you get this. It says, then immediately Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I don't know about you, but that's like a little shocking to me. You know, it's like not the first stop that I thought he would make on his journey to save the world. But that's... That's what it says. In fact, verse 2 is a little bit funny to me. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Is that the most obvious verse in all of the Bible? You know, you're like, thank you for that truth. Verse 2, we can pray out now. But anyway, verse 3, it says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you may not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8 says, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said. If you will just kneel down and worship me, look at verse 10. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Verse 11, last verse says, then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Really excited today to start this brand new series, The God of Control, with part one that I have entitled, Slain Through Submission. Slain Through Submission. Submission, and I will explain exactly what that means. Anybody in here today, you ever, uh, you ever get in fights with people that you love? Anybody? It's kind of a conundrum. People that you, you ever get in fights with people that you love? Arguments, disagreements, maybe you throw a couple punches. Any, any crazy people? Okay, great. We'll pray for you. Appreciate your honesty. Um, but but, but, but i got to be honest today with you. Um, I, me and my wife, we, we get into fights. We do. I know that we had some perfect people in here, by the way, people who didn't raise their hand. I'm honored to be in your presence today. But me, as far as me and my house, i got to be honest, my wife and I, we get into fights. We do. And I know you're like, hey, that sounds kind of negative. You know, you probably just disagree. No, we get in fights, okay? i gotta, I got to tell you. We get in fights because my wife is a spicy Latina. All right. And I am a common white guy. I don't have any excuse for why I'm crazy. I don't know why I am, but it's just the way it is. And so so we get into fights and and we argue about things that most married couples argue about, you know, like bills and our schedules, how to parent, you know, redecorating the living room for the fifth time this year. Just normal, normal stuff. Right. Right? Everything in my living room needs to be white and gold now because Pinterest says so. Okay, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter, but you can pray for me. That's true. Um, But what I'm noticing lately is that the thing that we are disagreeing about the most lately is what we watch on television. Who gets to control the controller? That's been a big fight uh, in our house. i got to admit today, I like television. I do. I know I'm a sinner, but I really do like like television. My favorite, I love to watch sports. My favorite sport is football. And I don't know what it is. There's just something about football. Like after a long, hard day at work, there's something about going home and watching fully grown men recklessly try and hurt each other. It brings me peace. I don't know why. There's something wrong with me, okay? 
but, but for some reason it's great. But, but my son, the problem is my son doesn't like football. Right? He's not quite old enough. He's not there yet. He doesn't like football. He doesn't want to watch it. He usually whines when I put on sports. He wants to watch his favorite show. And my son's favorite show right now is this show. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it. It's a show called Paw Patrol. Anybody ever heard of Paw Patrol? It's his favorite show. And if you've never heard of it, it's kind of an interesting show. It's a show about a world where kids are in charge, adults are stupid, and puppies save the day. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's weird, but it's kind of entertaining. I'm not sure it's helping him develop or, uh, or really respect me as an adult, but he likes it, and so that's fine. But the problem with Paw Patrol is my wife hates Paw Patrol. My wife does not want to watch Paw Patrol ever, and that's probably because she stays home with her son all day, and she's probably seen every episode three times, and so she is so tired of Paw Patrol. When that theme song comes on, she freaks out. She starts yelling, turn it, turn it, right? And she wants to turn it because she wants to watch what she wants to watch. And you know the show that my wife really likes to watch? It's the show, again, maybe you've heard of it. It's called Fixer Upper. Anybody heard, you heard of that show? She likes to get brainwashed, right, by Joanna Gaines so she can spend more money on her house. I hate that show, let me tell you. Yeah, she's always changing everything. And so we can't really seem to figure this thing out. We can't figure out what we're going to watch, who's going to be in control of the controller. And so it's this big control battle. But what I'm learning in my life is that when I try to control my spouse, when I try to control my kid, when I try to control really my marriage, I can't really enjoy it. Have you noticed this? When I try to control my life, I, I can't really get the most out of it. Whenever I beat my wife in an argument, for some reason, it doesn't really feel like I won. It's weird. It doesn't feel like I won anything. In fact, what I'm learning is that when I win, we both lose. Yeah. We both lose. Why? Because, because what's the goal of marriage? What's the goal? Is it, is it winning? Is it being in control? No, it's actually being one. It's being in unity. It's trying to lay down my desire for what I want to give you what you want. And how do you do that? How do you become one? Winning an argument? Being in control? I mean, is that what we do? Is that what works in our relationship with God? I don't think so, but I think we spend a lot of time trying to make that happen in our relationship with God. I think we spend a lot of probably time in our prayer life trying to convince God that our plan is best, that he should kind of adopt you know, our way of thinking and our plan. I think we spend a lot of time in prayer trying to control God, asking him to do what, what we want him to do. And let us not forget today that prayer is not us inviting God into our plan, but it is God inviting us into his plan. It's not as much about our plan as much as it is about God, and that's a hard lesson to learn, that it's not about being in control. You know, the Bible says you can ask God for anything. And much of what you ask for, it says he will give it to you. But what if he doesn't? Are we going to follow him then? Are we going to submit to him then? Or what if he gives you something, but he gives you a specific purpose for it? And he tells you what to do with it. Would we submit to that? You see, this story is an example of God the Father giving his son something that he wanted. The Bible says that Jesus did not come to earth kicking and screaming. He did not come because the Father made him save us. He actually wanted to save us. In Philippians 2, it says that when Jesus was up in heaven on his throne, when he was in total control, he, he, he had a day where he thought, you know, I don't think that this control is something to be used for my own advantage, but it's something to be given away to help other people. And so the Bible says he emptied himself of all control, of all power. He actually became nothing, and he had to rely fully on God. When he was here, he said, I, I can't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. I can't say anything unless my father tells me to say it. He was completely out of control. He didn't have it anymore. He had to rely on God and the Holy Spirit. And, and what's happening at the Jordan River, like we were talking about a few minutes ago, that's just, again, that's his coming out party. What an exciting moment. He's there. He's getting baptized. His cousin's there, right? The Holy Spirit's sweeping through that place. God is there speaking over him. It's a great moment when he's getting sent out to be the savior of the world. But then what happens next is really unexpected. It says that he goes to a wilderness, a dry place to be tempted by the devil. I don't know about you, but I find that really strange. Like that's just not what I thought his next stop would be. It, it, what happens is Jesus is driven in the wilderness because he has to be tested. And that's really frustrating because that happens to all of us. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but a lot of times when God speaks to me, when he gives an encouragement, when he gives a new opportunity, what comes next? A challenge. Often what comes next is a test. And it can be really shocking when it comes. It can happen immediately. In Mark's rendition of the story, if you read in Mark chapter 1, it says Jesus is dunked in the water. He comes up. The father says, hey, son, I'm well pleased with you. 
in the very next verse, it says, immediately he was driven into the wilderness to hang out with the devil. Like, that's what happened. And some of you have felt that before. You have felt the immediately. God speaks to you, and, and, and he gives you an opportunity. It's happened to me a lot. We'll have some rocking Sundays here at church where God's speaking, and people are giving their life to the Lord. They're connecting with other people. And sometimes before I even get home, I'm met with the immediately. A fight with your spouse or something to do with work, some kind of bad news, and it leaves us asking God, now what? God, where are you? But what we need to know today is the wilderness is necessary. The wilderness, there's so much purpose in the wilderness. We need to see that this season was needed for Jesus because it was testing to him. And until you've been tested, you can't be trusted from God. You know, a lot of us in our life, we trust God. We trust God. We trust God will submit to his will until you fill in the blank. I, I trust God until something happens to my family, and then I'm out, you know? Why would, why would a God ever let that? He, he wouldn't do it. I'm out. And we turn our back on God. God, I trust you until something happens to my money. And then I'm out. Because, you know, you're the God that provides. This would never happen. I mean, fill in the blank. When, when, when we get some kind of opposition or inconvenience, that's often when we not only turn our back on God, but sometimes we'll turn towards God and we'll accuse him. God, why? Why would you do this? I thought you had a plan. I thought you were going to work it out. I thought you told me to trust you, and all of a sudden, it makes no sense. i got to be honest. This, the story with Jesus makes no sense to me. Right? He, he gets called out to do ministry, and then he goes to hang out with the devil. It makes no sense, but a huge part of learning to give up control to God is trusting him when it makes no sense. Can, can you worship him then? Can you trust him in a day again when it makes no sense? I think the most authentic worship that we can give to God, the most authentic faith that we gain with God happens in a season that makes no sense. It's when I can trust him anyway, when I don't get it, but I'll follow anyway. You know, you can tell what's in you in a pressure situation. That's, that's when you, others, and God get to see what you're really made of. In fact, that's a good question to ask yourself today. When pressure is applied to you, what comes out of you? Worry or worship? What comes out of you? Praise or accusation to God? God would like to know if you can lean on his understanding in a wilderness season. I mean, that's, that's what the famous verse encourages us with, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. says, trust in the Lord with what? With all your heart. Right? Follow him wholeheartedly. We say that a lot here at church. Not just trusting in him in one area of your life, but every area of your life. Lean not on your own understanding. And when I read that, I just have to pause and tell you, this is probably the hardest thing in my own walk with God, is trusting Him and following Him when I don't understand. Okay, is anybody like me in here today? Anybody, you're kind of a head case? You get stuck in your head a lot? Come on, don't leave me up here by myself. Thank you. I thought we were family, you know? Um, but I get stuck in my head a lot, and I think way too much. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to put everything together and make sense of it all. It's very, very hard for me to follow and trust God when I don't get it. I don't know if you're like me. I do a lot of mental math. Okay, when I, I think about my life, I take this, I add this to it, I subtract that because God doesn't want that, and, and I put all these things together, and I come up with a solution of what I think I deserve and what I should get, and often it does not match what I see on the outside. And it makes no sense to me. And it makes me ask God why all the time. You ever ask God why? I spend a lot of my good energy, good thoughts, nights of sleep, Asking God why. Some of the best years of my life trying to understand everything as if that's my job. It's not our job to understand everything. In fact, the encouragement, right, it's just another way that we're trying to control God. It's another thing we need to surrender to God. The encouragement in the verse is what? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge what? That he is God and we are not. Acknowledge him in all our ways. And when you do, what's the promise? He says, if you surrender to me, I promise... I'll make your path straight. <laughs> straight? Uh, there's nothing straight about this path. Like Jesus lived a perfect life. It didn't seem straight to me. It's like he should have gone this way and he went way over there. Did you notice? He took a massive detour. Nothing straight about that. But what happens is when you surrender to God long enough, years go by, and you, you end up turning around and looking at something that happened to you and you start to see God in it. It starts to make sense of why he let that happen. It wasn't fun in the moment, but it starts to make sense. You see God and how he worked it out and what he did in you. you. You know you're letting the God of control die in your life 
when you can start to thank him, not just for the seasons that made you smile most, but the seasons that made you grow the most. Right? They weren't the most fun, but you turn around and you're like, God was in that. Right? If we could get real today, some of us maybe have had a season where you got caught. Maybe there was something in your life that was secretive. Your spouse didn't know, your friend didn't know, your boss didn't know, and you got caught. That's not fun, get, getting exposed to something in our life. But some of us, if you surrender to God enough, you could turn around and say, wow, that saved my life. I needed that. Right? Some, some of these seasons are the least fun, but sometimes they're the most necessary. Right? You think that wilderness made Jesus smile? No, because he wasn't eating food. You know, I know for a fact that he was not smiling. I don't know if any of you have ever fasted before. It's like 95% miserable. This is like me encouraging you to do it, by the way, because the 5%, you know, God speaks to you. It's tough. It's a really hard thing to do. Like how many of you are like, I wish he left that verse out, you know, about the fasting. I didn't, you know, the, the Bible says some things only come by prayer and fasting. And some of you are like, I can live without those things. Okay, I just need Jesus and I'm fine. Like you, you know that this season in his life was not the most fun. It didn't make him smile the most, but it was his test. It was his wilderness. And he needed that. He, he, needed, he needed this test. I call for Jesus. I call it his spiritual seminary. It's where his submission to God proved to be real or not. It's where he proved that he was actually going to follow God no matter what. You know, it's not hard to submit to God in the water. It's not hard to submit to God when, you, when your friends are around or there's worship music playing. His cousin is there. You know, God's there speaking. The spirits. It's not hard to have faith in that place. It actually sounds a lot like church. It's not, hard, it's not as hard to submit to God in here. You know what I'm talking about? It's not as hard to get excited about God in here. It's the comfortable place. How hard is it to have faith in the comfortable place where we can throw our hands up and shout God's name and get excited? You could pray loud. You could amen. Some of y'all don't even do that. But listen, if you don't do that in here, you'll never do it out there. If you don't do it in the place where it is accepted, you will never do it in the place where it is not accepted. And yet, isn't that where God wants us to be the loudest? Out there? You know, we said this before, but in the book of Acts, there's 40 miracles in the book of Acts. 39 of them are not done in here. They're done in the wilderness, on the outside. Why? Because the darker it is, the lighter the, the light shines, and the more it is needed. This is where God wants to do his finest work in our life, and he wants to know, can you submit to me in the wilderness like you do in the water when it's comfortable? Because, if listen, if we're so loud in here, worship was awesome today. Can I just say that? It was. I don't know what it was. There's another. In the fire? Was that the first time we played? That's a great song. I was so excited. I was like, let's just, can we do it again? That was great. Let's just keep singing. We don't, I don't need to talk. Yeah, I do. Anyway, let's just, it was great. I loved it. You know, we, we get so loud in here, jumping up and down, throwing our hands up. What good is it if we're loud in here but silent out there? It's, it's not, I'm not sure that's the submission that God wants. And so he sends Jesus into the wilderness. Why? Because he didn't just call Jesus to change his small group or people on the serve team or people in church, but people out there, people who don't know him yet. God brings him to the wilderness so he can fight his battle. You know, if, if you follow Jesus today, you need to know that you were born into a war. It's a war versus light and darkness. And at all times, you are perpetuating one or the other. You are either shining light or you are blending in. To the darkness. You are, you're leading people to or, or away from Jesus. The Bible says that when you give your life to Jesus, you're born again. And, and you surrender one fight with God. As you do that, you enter into another fight for God, with God, besides God. And that fight we're in is this Matthew 4.10 fight. It's what Jesus says. When all the pressure of the world is applied to Jesus. By the way, when pressure is applied to Jesus, what comes out? Scripture. Hey, come on, anybody want to be like that? Like one day. One day I want to be like that. I'm not there yet, okay? But I would like to be like that. Well, Kat, what comes out of Jesus is Matthew 4.10. You must worship and serve God alone. And listen, that's our fight. We are here to help people, including ourselves, but the only one worthy of praise, submission, faith, and obedience is God. But here's what the devil does, okay? The devil tries to distract us from these fights, to, to get us to do other things, to enter into fights we weren't made to fight, Fights that we were not created for. Like, like you look at the first, what's the first temptation? It says, Jesus, you see this stone, why don't you turn it into bread? In other words, like, hey, why don't you just indulge a little bit, you know? Why don't you just get more stuff? Why don't you just get more of what the world has to offer? Isn't that a fight we're all constantly in? We spend most of our life just trying to get more. 
just more stuff. And then we look at God like, God, what's up? Why, why haven't you given me more? Why? Why am I not good enough? Have I not been in church a lot? Like, why haven't you given me more? And we, and we jockey and fight and we pray. And we just ask God for more, for more, for more. But what's Jesus say? That's not my fight. It's not my fight. He says, my fight is not trying to get more. It's trying not to need more of this stuff. I'm just trying to need God and have that be good enough. And the only way you can do that is what? Submitting to God. What's this next one? His next one is, hey, you see this ledge? Why don't you just jump off? Fly over here. Fly over there. God's going to follow you wherever you go. And that's a big temptation and message we hear in this world. Hey, God's going to follow you wherever you go. You don't need to follow God. He's going to follow you. As if God is our servant and our crutch, just here to help us fulfill our own dream. That's a big message about God. It's not who God is. What's Jesus say? That's not my fight. He says, I know God's love is so good, it'll follow me wherever I go. But my fight is not to run away from it. It's to run towards it. It's to run towards his plan because it's better than mine. And you look at this last one. Oh, this last one is like below the belt. This last one is kind of mean, okay? <laughs> Here's what he says. He says, you see all these people? I can make them bow their knee to you. And here's why that's tough, because isn't that what God told him would happen? Yeah, yeah, you see, here's what the devil does. The devil uses good things to tempt us. He's too smart to come to you and say, hey, throw your life away, turn your back on your family, don't submit to God. He's too smart for that. And so what he does here is he uses good things to tempt us. He uses a godly thing in an ungodly way. A godly thing in an ungodly way. Why? Because he's tricky. He goes to Jesus and says, hey, don't you want every need about you? I mean, no, that's in the Bible. That's a promise the Father made to Jesus. One day, every knee will bow to you. But what's the devil do? He comes up with a plan to make it happen sooner, to cut a corner. I don't know about you, but I love cutting corners. Like, God, God is going to give me a blessing. He's going to use me, but I want it now, okay? And so I'm like, how can I cut a corner? You know, I, I wouldn't say that out loud, but now I'm being honest in church, and I said it. But sometimes I want to do that. I, I want to cut corners. So what does that mean? The, the ends do not justify the means with God. Uh, more important maybe than what you do is how you do it. He didn't, he didn't want to cut a corner because of what he had to give up with God. And can, I, can I tell you today that there's some things in your life, maybe God has spoken over you, that you would get married, you would have kids, you would have this opportunity. If it's not here yet, it's just not time. God is still molding you. And the more you try and like speed through the molding season, the more painful it's going to be. And the devil would love, why? Because if you get a blessing before you're ready, it'll crush you. You won't be able to carry it. It'll be a responsibility too big. It'll be something that you can't enjoy. If it's not, for, if it's not in God's timing, it'll crush you. It's not a gift anymore. It's a curse. That's exactly what the devil would love to help us with, to cut a corner. And you might be in here like, you know, I think I'm past that season, you know, of cutting corn. How about Abraham, who's 90 years old, sleeping with somebody who's not his wife? Because God made a promise. You'll be the father of all nations. But what? He, he wasn't here yet, so he's, he, he made up another plan at 90 to sleep with someone, not his wife. He goes outside of God's plan. And, and that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to take something in God's plan, but outside of God's timing for your life. It's just not time yet. It's not time yet. And so what does Jesus have to say to him? This guy says, you see all these people? You see these people. All the glory in the world. All the following. All the Instagram followers in the world. I can give it to you. I can give it to you. Just... Just bow to me. See, the devil's temptation to Jesus looks much like the temptation he gives to us. And he says, I want to help you control your stuff, how much you get. I, I want to help you control the path of your life, where you go. I want to help you control people, who they give attention to, who they praise, and who they serve. I don't know about you, but I would like to be in control of all these things most of the time. I would really like that, but that's not the fight we were made for. It's not. And let me say this. When you, when you ignore the fight you were made for, you'll enter a fight you have no grace for. Okay? And I have to explain what that means. Okay? Here, here's what that means. Those fights are all exhausting. Have you noticed? Yeah. Trying to control people is pretty tiring. <laughs> what they do, what they say about you, what they don't say, that is so tiring. That'll ruin your life. That'll exhaust you to no end. How about trying to control uh, where your life goes? That your life progresses perfectly and your social status goes up perfectly. That is exhausting. Or how about all your stuff? i got to protect all my money <laughs> and all my stuff and make sure it's all safe and invested properly. That is tiring. I'm not saying it's bad, but when we try and control it, 
It is very tiring. Why? Because God is not behind that fight. He's not helping you fight that fight. He's not giving you any grace to try and control the areas in your life. And any victory you gain on your own, you'll have to keep it up on your own. But any victory you gain through submitting to God, he'll sustain it for you. He'll do it for you. He'll fight for you. And that brings peace in the midst of a fight. You know, I don't like the word fight too much. Only reason I use the word fight is because that's what the Bible says in Ephesians 6.12. It says this fight is not flesh and blood. It's not people. It's not stuff. It's not your plan of where you're going. It's a spiritual fight. And it didn't start with you or me or Jesus. It started back in the Garden of Eden. The first people, Adam and Eve, right? God says, hey, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. And then he says, I want you to subdue the earth. Meaning what? I want you to help the rest of the world surrender to God. But who comes along? Who's in the garden? The same person in the garden was the same person in the wilderness with Jesus. Same person in your hardship, and it's the devil. And he comes and he says what? Are you sure you want to listen to that? Are you sure that you want to do what God says? You don't want to eat from that tree. It's the first tempting to all of us. It's to question God's control of your life. The surrender of God from you to God in your life. And he offers us what? Eat of this tree. Be like God. That's what he said. He said, God doesn't want you to do that because he knows you'll be in control of your life. You'll be like God. The problem with that is they were already like God. How many people know? God said in, in Genesis 1.26, he looked at the Son and the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, let's make people like us. You are like God. Okay? When you submit to God, you become more like God. But when you take control, you become God. On your own. With a little G, by the way. Not, not the uppercase G, with a little G. And that's not really a fight that you want to be in. In your life, you don't want to be in control of your own life, right? You become what the devil wants to become. Do you know that's what made the devil fall from heaven? He didn't want to be like God or with God. He wanted to be God, meaning you're never more like the devil than, you want to take, than when you want to take control of your life. That's a hard reality to think on, but it's true. He would love to invite us to join him in this fight against God. You see, every time God speaks to you, gives you a word or an opportunity, you can trust that the devil is not far behind, here to offer you another way, right? a boat going 1,500 miles in a different direction, to test our submission, to see if it's real. And as long as we are here with flesh on, skin and bone on, this fight's not going anywhere. The devil tempting us right, to take back control of our life, it's not going anywhere. But here's what I wanted to tell you today. This fight that we're in is not like most fights. It's, it's not meant to be like most fights. Most fights, as you know, are stressful. They're tiring. They take everything out of us. They can become violent. It's not what this fight is supposed to be. Why? Because the fight is not about the fight. It's about finding the Father in the fight so he can fight for you. You know, when you read the Bible, you, you read about all these fights that God's people have with the enemies of God. And it's really interesting if you start to study each one what the point of the fight was. I mean, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we, we sang about it today. There's another in the fire. What do we find about that story in Daniel 3? It wasn't about the fire. It was about who was in the fire with them. Amen. In Joshua chapter 6, Joshua was facing the walls of Jericho. What do we find out? It's not about the walls. It's about who surrounded the walls. It wasn't them. It, it was God. Yeah. When the disciples are facing the storm in Matthew 14, it wasn't about the water. It's about who walked on the water. And Jesus, in the story in Matthew 4, it's not about the wilderness or who's in it. It's about finding the Father in the wilderness. There's a verse I read. I shared it first service. I'll just share it here. We'll just go off on a tangent. Is that okay? we got two more hours. You good? Just kidding. Anyway, uh, there's a verse I read a few days ago. It's Isaiah 42. In verse 10, it says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to him all the way to the ends of the earth. Just sing to the Lord. It's verse 10, 11, 12, 13. It's all about praising God. And then in verse 14, it says this. It says, and when you do. God picks himself up as a man of war, and he goes and fights your battles for you. He destroys your enemies for you. And then he comes back, and here's the picture. He says, hey, great stuff. You've been fighting hard. And you're like, I haven't been fighting. I've just been enjoying you. And he's like, exactly. That was the point. That was the point. It was about, we could clap. Let's clap for the Lord. Thank you, three of you. We had three. That's the fight, submitting to God and watching him go fight our battles for us. It's not a fight we fight on our own, but we submit to God. 
The Bible says Jesus submits to God, and what? The devil has to leave. He has to leave. Why? Because he cannot stand in the face of any man or woman who stands up in the middle of a fight, in the middle of the peak or the valley, in the middle of a situation you don't understand. If you still stand and say, but yet I will trust in him. He has to leave. He has nothing else he can do. Right? We, we, when we surrender to God. And that submission slays the enemy. The enemy is slain through our submission to God. I'll say this. You know, in, the, in this world, surrender is what precedes a loss. But in God's kingdom, surrender is what precedes a win. The biggest wins in your life will come through sur- surrendering to God. The strength that God gives you in public comes from the submission that you give to him in private, just between you and him. That's why I believe Jesus' victory was won here. Nobody's around. There's no crowd. There's no microphone. How many know the real work of ministry is not done on a stage? It's not done with lights in front of a big crowd. or any, it's not, That's not it. It's done in the shadows when nobody's looking, when it's you and God. He's saying, how are you going to worship me now? When you don't understand, when you see nobody, <laughs> you have no influence, you have no platform, how are you going to worship me now? This is where the real work of ministry is done. And so for today, the question is, what is it for you? What is the thing in your life you're trying to control? It could be your stuff. It could be money. It could be people, your spouse, your kids, your health. What is it? What we need to do is we need to put it in front of God and just worship him. Say, God, I don't know if I really understand what's going on right now, but I want to surrender to you anyway.